I F. Stone, 25 years, Washington correspondent. It's we're on the air. It's awfully difficult to live a life where you're almost always wrong. It's even more difficult to live a life where you're almost always right. But he has decided he would live that awful life and be almost always right. Is he Stone? There was a standing ovation for Mr. Stone. I want you to know that after reading the attacks in the newspapers late last night, that I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to be in Berkeley, where for the first time in years, students cared enough for free speech to fight about it. And now to be here again when you're using that free speech in the defense of our country. Don't mind what your detractors say, because you are really the kind of Americans that are carrying on the America of Jefferson, and he would be proud of you. Professor Scalapino seems to complain that not enough of us have been to, to Vietnam. And I must start by confessing that I haven't been to Vietnam. And I'm not an expert on Vietnam. And I'm not an expert on guerrillas. But if you'll pardon the pun, I do know a little bit about monkey business. And there's been an awful lot of that in this Vietnamese war. You know, a trip to Vietnam is not necessarily uh, a way of uh, bringing back uh, absolutely first-rate information. I can remember that five years ago, a man named Lyndon Johnson went to Vietnam and came back and told us that Diem was the Churchill of Asia. And four years ago, General Taylor came back and said that within 18 months we would have Vietnam pacified. So those who have gone to Vietnam are not necessarily uh, the best advisors. I cannot understand the fury in the press and among the respectables against the teach-ins. The State Department has it almost entirely its own way. The government line dominates the press and the radio and the TV. Why are they so frantic when for a little while and a few moments and on a few campuses and a few places uh, a voice of dissent is heard, a little bit of debate is begun? Are they so unsure of themselves? Uh, are they secretly uh, so weak uh, about their own point of view? that they fear to have it exposed to public debate and public uh, uh, examination. You know, when the State Department holds its conferences, it never invites the opposition. It never invites a critic. It doesn't even, inv it doesn't even invite critical newspaper men to private briefings for fear they might ask embarrassing questions. The, at the atmosphere of the State Department is very much like, of the big, like that of the big government agencies in Moscow. You get the same apparatchik atmosphere, the same regurgitation by bureaucratic parrots of the official line. And this is what we have to deal with uh, in our own country. You know, there's a great deal we don't know about war and about why men fight. We know a lot about what people have said uh, were the reasons they were fighting for. But modern psychology has taught us that, that the explanations people give for their activities are, are rarely the truth. And so it is in this case. One of the 
one of the reasons for all the trouble our country is in around the world, I think, is that we possess so huge a military establishment. If a country doesn't have soldiers, it takes a slight and makes a protest, and that's the end of it. But when it has an enormous military apparatus like ours, the tendency is to try to solve all kinds of political and economic questions by military means. A process that's something like uh, trying to repair a watch with a sledgehammer. And conversely, as long as we have a large military establishment, it's going to be looking for work to do, to maintain its appropriations, uh, to get its promotions, uh, to prove its usefulness, and to avoid technological unemployment. And all this miasma about wars of liberation that is so central to what is happening today in Vietnam and the Dominican Republic is really a reflection of the, the military's desire to find work to do. The war of liberation neurosis is made to order for the military. We have, in our own country, a very good test case of what causes a war of liberation. Is it caused by Moscow or Peking or by little men with flit Marxist flit guns from Havana? Or does it rise from some other causes? And I want to present to you today this test case. You know, if the South had a State Department and wanted to issue a white paper on the Negro revolt in the South, it could issue a white paper with a great deal more validity than the State Department's. It could prove, it could assert with considerable justice that Southern Negroes seem to be apathetic, if not content with their lot, until a lot of Northern agitators uh, came down there and stirred them up. It would be very easy for them to, uh, to, to give the dates of border crossings of by infiltrators from the north. It would be very easy to, to prove that some, of these Ill, that some of these infiltrators were people with communistic or semi-communistic or three-quarter communistic uh, backgrounds of one case or another. And uh, to argue that the way to deal with the Negro revolt was to kill the agitators, drive them back to the north, and if necessary, bomb Washington or New York until they called the whole thing off. If we dealt with the Negro question, the way we deal with Vietnam and the Dominican Republic, this is what our government would be doing. Fortunately, because Negroes can vote, because people are aware of what is going on, because there is a conscience, because there is a national ideology of equality, and because there's another election coming on, the Johnson administration treats with this quite differently. It sees that, of course, there are radicals of various varieties uh, uh, going south to help the Negro, and thank God for it. They're doing a great, they're doing a great service to our country. The government sees that whether or not the Southern Negro, left alone, would be content for another five years or another ten years to live in misery, humiliation, and third-class citizenship, that ultimately a change has to be brought about, that these aspirations have to be met, that equality has to be achieved, that the, that the war of liberation in the South has its roots in genuine, profound, and undefeatable human aspirations. This difference in attitude may help us to understand the peculiar paradox under which we, have a, we live in a country that generation after generation uh, makes progress by democratic means, uh, def defeats cries of red menace, brings about social reform, and yet cr crushes social reform abroad. At home, uh, people make themselves felt. Uh, they make their opinions felt. In foreign policy, uh, there's a great, there has been a great indifference, uh, a lack of knowledge, and the only uh, sources from which the State Department and the government hears are the 
uh, the uh, Standard Oil Company, Aluminum Company of America, United Fruit Company, uh, the great businesses and enterprises that have uh, interests uh, abroad. Now, the, this uh, false approach to the Vietnamese uh, question uh, explains our inability to face up to its real origins uh, or to face up to the methods needed to end it. You know, ruling classes all through history have always preferred uh, demonological explanations for, uh, for uh, revolutions. Uh, uh, this this uh, absolves them from responsibility for their own misdeeds and it enables them to spot and personify the demons and to hand them over to the police uh, and, to the, uh, and to the military force. Now there's nothing demonological about the origins of this war in Vietnam. It has a threefold origin. In the first place, it's a racial war. And I want to give you one little example of why men have been fighting for so long in Indochina. You've heard of Prince Savannah Fuma and Prince Savannah Vong of Laos. They're half-brothers. And they went to Paris in their youth and were brilliant students at the, at the best French engineering school, and one in addition became a great, the leftist leader became a great classical scholar. And when they got back to Laos, as engineers, with a French education and a French degree and a brilliant record, they found that they were being paid half of what French engineers got and being treated as inferiors despite their education uh, despite their, their uh, princely blood. Uh, and this feeling of, of humiliation, uh, this, uh, this lack of respect, uh, which is the basic thing in the, in, the, in the Negro and colored and colonial uprising all over the world, explains the uprising in Indochina. Now, this, the second reason for the continued war there is that the West has been unwilling to accommodate itself in Indochina uh, to this rising protest. Uh, where the West has withdrawn, as in India or as in Africa, we have peace. And where we have tried to beat down uh, this feeling of resentment, this desire for independence, for equality, and for self-respect, we have continued war. And these wars, we hear a great deal about broken promises on the part of the communists. And certainly there have been broken promises and negotiations uh, with the communists. But it's time to look, to look at the mode in our own eye and see the broken promises that have uh, kept the war going in Indochina. The first broken promise was at the end of the Second World War. You know, the Japanese uh, tried to obtain native support in Asia uh, with the slogan of Asia for the Asians and uh, to make it a crusade against the white man. And to counteract that propaganda, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the Atlantic Charter uh, uh, made the promise after that after the war there would be no more imperialism and no more colonialism. And thanks to those prob promises, uh, which thrilled uh, the underground fighters against Japanese imperialism, uh, our fighters and our men uh, found aid in Indochina uh, from the forces of Ho Chi Minh. And uh, when the war ended, uh, the Viet Minh uh, felt that the French were their comrades in a worldwide struggle against racism, that they would be treated decently by them, and uh, they made an agreement uh, with France uh, to, to uh, stay in the French Union in return for autonomy uh, and to let the French handle uh, uh, foreign affairs and uh, certain other attributes of government, but to give them self-government. Under cover of that agreement, the French marched their troops back into the Tonkin Delta and were greeted as friends and liberators and very quickly uh, broke their promises, tried to divide the country, opened an attack on Haiphong, and began the terrible war that ended for them eight years later at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, who has always been a moderate, uh, tried to, to prevent the, uh, to try to bring an end to the fighting. He sent a cable to Leon Blum, who was a friend of his and who was then deputy premier of a popular front government in Paris, asking Blum to end the fighting. 
The French censors uh, held up the cable, and uh, by the time it got through, it was too late to stop it. And that was the first broken promise. And the second broken promise came at, in, in, uh, 10 years later at Geneva, when the West promised that if the Viet Minh laid down their arms and accepted the temporary division of their country at the 17th parallel, that free elections would be held within two years for the peaceful reunification of the country. And that was the second broken promise. And from these broken promises and, and from uh, certain uh, 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 conditions in the South Vietnam itself, uh, the new war with which we have to contend uh, grew up. You know, the State Department has developed a whole mythology of the war. Uh, they have claimed in their white paper and in their blue book and in the speeches of, of, uh, of uh, Rusk and, and uh, of Secretary McNamara that uh, DM was so successful, the people so contented, uh, prosperity uh, uh, so, well, uh, so well established in South Vietnam that the communists in despair uh, began a guerrilla war uh, to get rid of the DM regime. Now this is this is the complete reverse of the truth. The fact is that the Indo-Chinese War, like other wars of liberation, did not begin because the people who fought them uh, happened to read a pamphlet by Karl Marx or Lenin or even by General Zhao. Uh, people don't uh, people don't leave their families and their homes and and go out into the mud and the marshes and the jungles uh, to live like hunted animals to hunger, uh, to face uh, instant death uh, because uh, they've read a pamphlet. They go out there because the conditions opposed upon them have become so unbearable and so dreadful that they prefer death uh, to, uh, 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 to prefer to fight even at the risk of death uh, to, to a continuation of the despotism. You know, we, we claim that we've been carrying on a, a crusade in, uh, in uh, Vietnam for democracy and against communist dictatorship. But the fact is that in all these years that we have controlled South Vietnam, there have only been two days of a free press. And the, the two days after Diem was overthrown, and free newspapers began to appear. And when they began to call for peace and neutrality, uh, the freedom of the press was outlawed. From the very beginning, although we claim to be acting in the name of democracy, we have supported dictatorship of the most onerous kind. We talk about uh, the fact that uh, we excuse the absence of the promised elections on the ground that uh, free elections could not have been held in North Vietnam. But whether that's true or false, why didn't we hold some free elections in South Vietnam? Why didn't we uh, show in South Vietnam that we were in favor of democracy? Why didn't we provide a, a showcase, as it were, a contrast uh, with the rule in the North? The fact is that uh, in the very year when elections were supposed to be held, a DM began to establish his dictatorship in the South. In January of 1956, he issued a decree setting up concentration camps for persons suspected of being hostile to the state. And into those camps went over the years thousands of oppositionists, communists, socialists, uh, uh, bourgeois oppositionists, uh, uh, critics of all kinds. In June of 1956, he abolished free election of village councils. The, the, the most important thing for the peasant uh, was the council ruling the village. And here DM showed his hand by abolishing uh, free elections and providing for the appointment of the, of the uh, village uh, uh, rulers uh, from Saigon and often from among uh, Northerners and Catholics and, uh, and uh, refugees uh, who had very little contact or sympathy uh, with the people. <coughs> the, the, uh, the war began in spite of the communist line. For four or five years after the Geneva Conference, uh, China and North Vietnam pursued the policy of peaceful coexistence. 
uh, the war, the the the, uh, the shootings and the uprising began slowly in the in the uh, 50s uh, before that line was changed. Uh, Hanoi did not uh, give support to the rebellion until 1960. Uh, this was a spontaneous uprising, and uh, and its aims were were uh, were democratic uh, aims. Uh, we have never allowed uh, uh, free elections in uh, Vietnam, and we're hostile to them now. Uh, on two recent occasions, at one public press conference and at one private briefing, uh, I asked Secretary Rusk and I asked another high official, uh, would we be willing, uh, if we were satisfied that all uh, uh, aid and, uh, and arms were, were shut off from the North, uh, would we be willing to uh, tell the Viet Cong that if they laid down their arms, uh, we would accept the verdict of the Vietnamese people uh, at a free election under, uh, under international auspices? And in both cases, uh, the question was evaded. Uh, the fact is, we don't want elections. Uh, we're afraid of the popular will. We're sure we would lose them. Uh, the Viet Cong have the people with them. You know, Professor Scalapino, uh, who has been so harsh about this teach-in, uh, spoke at the Washington teach-in. And, uh, and he said at that time that uh, the Viet Cong did not have uh, a popular support in, uh, in, uh, in the country. And uh, I want to read you the testimony of two other scholars and observers uh, that contradict Professor Scalapino. And uh, one of them is from another professor who appeared on the government side uh, at the teach-in in Washington, although he did not quote what I'm about to quote for, 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 uh, at this time. Uh, professor Scalapino said, uh, he asked the question, does the Viet Cong really command the support and allegiance of the people of South Vietnam? I think again, though the answer is complicated, Professor Scalapino said, the answer on balance must be no. And now, I want to read you two quotations, one about the attitude of the peasantry and one about the attitude of the middle class uh, toward the Viet Cong. The first is about the peasantry, and I quote, it would be a serious mistake to consider communist power in South Vietnam as based predominantly on terrorism or military strength or even upon the indifference of an ignorant peasantry. The fact is that communism in the dress of nationalism and its advocacy of land of the peasants represents a powerful force in South Vietnam and one which receives widespread support from the pe present peasant population. The peasantry is not so much a pawn as, or a prize as it is the arbiter in the struggle between communist and anti-communist nationalism." Unquote. That is from a book by Professor Robert Siliano, uh, South Vietnam, Nation Under Stress. Uh, it's a quote that Professor Siliano himself did not use uh, in defending the government's policy in Washington. And now I want to read you a quotation about the attitude of the middle class toward the Viet Cong. And this is by a, a very able French reporter uh, writing in, the, in a pro-French American, a pro-American pro French publication, Figaro, and he said, and I quote, all observers are in agreement on one point. The program and the conduct of the National Liberation Front have wanted the adherence, enthusiastic or resigned, of a lar very large part of the Vietnamese population. This is a fact which becomes particularly clear when one interviews middle class and intellectual people in Saigon. One of them summarizes the problem in this way. We have a choice between two solutions, to wage an endless war while placing ourselves more at the mercy of the Americans and without any guarantee that this will end in a clear-cut victory, or categorically to demand the end of the war and trust to the good faith of the National Liberation Front's leaders and to their willingness to carry out a program which to us appears acceptable. One thing at least is sure, Mazir Klo concluded, the fiction that American military power has been introduced upon demand of a people fighting communism no longer holds today.
I think that we ought to call for an end of the bombings in North Vietnam and an end of the bombings in South Vietnam. The bombings in South Vietnam have been overlooked in public protest, but they are as inhumane and as unjustifiable as the, uh, as the uh, bombings on the North. Uh, we are burning and destroying villages and villagers uh, all over the country uh, on the excuse that there may be one or two Viet Cong uh, uh, hiding among them. Uh, in many cases, uh, we have uh, destroyed villages uh, for no real military reason. And uh, the, the, uh, the inhumanity of it uh, is, is, uh, is just beyond, uh, beyond expression. The, uh, we ought to call for an end of the fighting, and we ought to call for, free, uh, for, elect, for American withdrawal and for elections under, under international auspices. The president keeps on saying that nobody wants to negotiate. But there have been offers from the other side. The terms uh, presented in the London Times April 1st by William Warby uh, on the basis of his conversations with Ho Chi Minh and uh, Pham Van Dung uh, represent a reasonable settlement. Uh, they called, uh, uh, very interestingly, for a, uh, a, uh, a federal solution in Vietnam under which uh, the North and the South would be independent of each other uh, uh, they would have, uh, they, uh, each would be able to have its own relations with uh, outside powers, cultural or economic. Neither would dominate the other, but there would be a resumption of, uh, of trade and relations between North and South. Uh, uh, elections uh, uh, to set up a, uh, a neutral regime under such circumstances would provide a, an honorable way out and, and a, uh, a stabilizing uh, a solution uh, to the war. The president has said uh, if we let the communists win in South Vietnam, uh, they will take what will happen to all the other new nations of the earth, these hundred new countries. Well, that really is poppycock. The fact is that uh, none of the new nations uh, have gone communist. Uh, where, where the West has been wise enough to withdraw, uh, to recognize national aspirations, to adjust itself to colonial demands, the communists have not taken over. Uh, Nasser is not a communist, Ben Bella is not a communist, Sekou Ture is not a communist, Nkrumah is not a communist. It is only where, as in Indochina, uh, we have uh, fought uh, uh, colonial aspiration, or in Cuba, where we have, by our embargo, uh, sought to strangle it. Uh, that new nations have, uh, have uh, joined the, uh, the communist uh, bloc. Uh, India, uh, which we prize so highly, uh, would not be safe for freedom today uh, if the British had stayed on and fought the uh, forces of liberation instead of uh, withdrawing uh, from the country. And one of the terrible things about this period is this. Uh, Britain and France and Holland I recognized colonial aspirations out of weakness. They no longer had the economic strength, they no longer had the will, they no longer had the manpower to carry on these colonial struggles. And so they withdrew. But our country does have the strength, and it does have the military means, and it does have the will. And if we're not careful, we're going to see our country attempting to impose a new imperialism and a new colonialism on Africa and Asia and Latin America. And the blood of thousands of young men would be spilled in that conflict to no avail and to our country's uh, degradation. Uh, the, the, danger, the danger of a drift toward a, an attempt to impose a Pax Americana is very, very real. The events in the Dominican Republic are a real eye-opener because there the excuse of a red menace was really flimsy and really nonsensical. And there our opposition to democratic forces is very clear and very unmistakable and a warning to all of us. You know, there are dreadful developments in the world. In the first place, there is a gap that you all know about in the terms of trade between the advanced nations and the poor nations. The 
rich nations are getting richer and the poor nations are getting poorer. The prices of their products are falling, the prices of ours are rising. That's one development. And secondly, a report released just the other day by the Department of Agriculture uh, points out that a terrible food gap is developing. That, that in about two-thirds of the countries of the earth, the uh, food production is falling behind population. And the danger of hunger is growing in huge areas of the earth. Uh, this combination of unfair terms of trade and growing hunger spells a new period of tremendous human unrest. And with these two gaps, there is now visible a third gap, and the most terrible gap of all. And that is the gap between the military power of the forces struggling for liberation in these countries and American military power. We have the means we have the means to burn these countries up. No matter how brave they are, no matter how resolute, no matter how devoted, we can, if we want to, send in enough planes and enough tanks and enough napalm and, if necessary, enough nuclear bombs to wipe them out. And this third gap, this gap in military power, uh, represents a dreadful temptation uh, to the military and to the right wing and our own countries. And they will succeed uh, if there grows up and is maintained another gap, and that is the gap between our democratic behavior at home and our undemocratic behavior abroad. It was very terrible in the recent Gallup poll to see that Johnson's popular support jumped after the Tonkin Bay reprisal raids last August and after the Pleiku reprisal raids in February. It is quite clear from those figures that there is a lot of unthinking, tough guy, you got to smash those guys reaction in our own country. And that we have a tremendously important task in keeping alive human values in our own country in awakening our fellow Americans to the real meaning of these struggles and to, and to make that awakening a break of some kind uh, on our enormous and mindless uh, military machine. You know, there was a Pax Romana at one time on which our military would model a Pax Americana. The legions began by crushing freedom abroad and ended by crushing it at home. The armed servants of the Caesars soon became their capricious masters. We all know what happened, and it was exactly with this in mind that Washington in his farewell address warned the American people against overgrown, those were his words, overgrown uh, military establishments as a menace to democratic uh, liberty. This uh, fight for peace uh, in which you're engaging is a fight against military domination, against bureaucratic control of our lives, of our thinking, of our avenues of communication, and of our future. The fight for peace abroad is a fight for freedom at home. You who will have to fight the wars that are coming. And we may see wars in Africa and in Asia and in Latin America where our troops march in against the people as they have done in these last few days in the Dominican Republic. Don't let yourself be intimidated. Don't let yourself be frightened from questioning the wisdom, the necessity, and the humanity of these futile bloodlettings. All that is best in the tradition of our country, its kindness, its humanity, its conscience, its devotion to freedom, rests on your shoulders. It's you who are fighting 
to keep alive what is best in our country, not your detractors. They would submit us to a new mindless bureaucratic machine. They would involve us in countless wars against the globe. They would destroy freedom at home uh, in the process. Uh, on your shoulders, in a very real sense, <coughs> rest the safety and the future and the real defense of our country. Mr. Stone has spent a lifetime asking questions. Because he has done so, he is fully prepared to answer some questions. And he has agreed to answer any questions, or to try to answer any questions which you may have. Uh, Mr. Stone is yours, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the, the question was a was about a statement issued by some of the uh, elder peace uh, peace uh, leaders uh, about the march on Washington, and uh, we're going to have the pleasure of having one of them here. I think he Norman Thomas, by his presence here, indicates where he stands, and I don't want to engage in a factional uh, factional personal discussion about it. Well, uh, he wants to, uh, the questioner, question is, why are we really in Vietnam? <coughs> We're really in Vietnam because we emerged from the, from the Second World War, the most powerful country in the world, and the natural expansionism that affects all nations and peoples, uh, acting on a nation as great as ours, impelled us to try to seek to dominate the world, and that's what we're trying to do. was about collective security, but I don't understand the question. We're not following the principles of collective security. We're following unilateral policies at, both the United, at the expense of both the United Nations and the Organization of American States. The gentleman wants to know if I'm satisfied with the situation in Cuba with Russian guns trained on us. No, I'm not. And the reason why the Russian guns are trained on us is because we would not give the Cuban people the right to determine their own destiny. I want to finish the question about Cuba. Uh, a, a, man, uh, a man down here asked me a very hostile question about Cuba, and then he disappeared. I hope he's still here, and I'd like to answer. The, I'd like to complete my answer. You know, because he raised a very serious question, and I'm afraid we're heading for very serious trouble. The Republican Policy Committee is asking for a war against Cuba to follow on the heels of war against the Dominican Republic. You know, several months before the missile crisis, the Council of Ministers of the Cuban government, and then President Dordikas, in an address to the United Nations, offered the demilitarization of the island if they could have firm international guarantees against American attack. And they offered to negotiate compensation for American landowners <coughs> if we would resume normal trade relations with them. Uh, that offer was made in a formal document sent to the United Nations by the Council of Ministers and by President Dardikos in public, hardly a word of it ever appeared in the American press. It was brushed aside. And we were soon brought to the brink of world war by our indifference and our arrogance in that question. I don't want to see a Russian base on our doorstep, and I don't want to see war with Cuba. I think the time, the time is long overdue to settle our differences with Cuba by peaceful negotiation and to resume trade. Only the other day, the government of Ceylon 
offered compensation to American oil companies. That what happened in Ceylon is exactly what happened in Cuba. The American oil companies were asked to refine a certain amount of cheaper Soviet oil. And they refused. And out of the refusal came a quarrel in which the companies were expropriated. But because Ceylon is far away and out of, out of reach, we've accepted peaceful negotiations there for compensation. In Cuba, we sought to strangle the country by shutting off all oil. And we took this wonderful island with its friendly people and a very brave and wonderful and devoted uh, people they are and put them on a platter and handed them to the Russians. And it's time to win them back to friendship. And it's also time to alert the American people to the growing talk of war in Washington against Cuba, a war which will be very bloody, which will cost us a lot of lives. The Cubans are very well armed. They're very brave. They have mountains and marshes, and they will fight. And if we set out to crush them, it will be a real crime and a real blot on our history. Well, the question is, uh, if elections had been held in, uh, in Vietnam in 54, 56, who would have held? Well, I consider this a baby question. Everybody now, by, uh, by now knows that Eisenhower in his memoirs uh, said that uh, all the experts he consulted agreed that if the promised elections had been held in 56, Ho Chi Minh would have won 80 percent. That was the figure that Eisenhower gave of the people. But if there had been elections in South Vietnam, I don't know how to answer that question. The point is that there was no uh, free organization of political parties allowed. There was no free press allowed. Uh, I think that if free elections were held now, a non-communist majority would appear. But it would be a neutralist government, and it would be a socialistic government. The, the program of the Viet Cong, whether sincere or insincere, does reflect the political realities of South Vietnam in several respects. One, the peasantry in the South fought Diem because he tried to take back the land. The, the French landlords had fled during the war against the French. They had the land and they took it. DM, under cover of a land reform, really asked them to pay compensation or rent for lands they considered their own. Now today, the peasantry in South Vietnam are afraid of losing their land to a communist government as the peasants have in the North. And therefore, the program of the National Liberation Front promises the maintenance of private property rights in land. Secondly, there is a good deal of of sectionalism in the country and a great desire for southern autonomy within a reunited country. This also is reflected in the National Liberation Front program. And thirdly, the intellectuals in the South do not want to be subjected to the kind of heavy-handed, stultifying, typical Communist Party bureaucratic controls of thought and literature that they have in the North. So that the, the, the NLF program is a program for a democratic South Vietnam, a neutral South Vietnam, with peaceful relations with the North, some kind of union, but controlling its own destinies and able to have its own relations with the Western world. This indicates what kind of a, what kind of a government would come into being if we allowed it to do so. But our government, is afraid of a socialistic government. It's afraid of a democratic government. That's why we fight Bosch in the Democratic Republic, Dominican Republic. We know he's no communist. He's as, he's as pure a Democrat as we could find. And it's because he's too pure a Democrat for our taste. Bosch said, if I didn't affect to the American government, if I do what you say, if I suppress the left, then I'm going to, to drive the youth of the left into, the, into, into terrorism and into guerrilla activity. And he refused to do so. And this is why we didn't like him. This is why the, our military didn't like him. We don't want a democratic government in South Vietnam. We want a military base. The gentleman here had a question.
the general the, the gentleman says that uh, that there's been a qualitative change in the Johnson administration that he's now following gold war water policies and therefore the what we're doing in the Dominican Republic is not accidental I agree Well, the, the question is about our economic investments in, in uh, Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Uh, I don't think this is primarily an economic question. I think it's primarily a question of, <coughs> of power politics. Uh, we, we're, we're afraid of popular movements in Latin America and, and uh, where we do have very basic interests. Our military and our right-wingers are afraid that if we uh, are defeated in Vietnam or have to leave Vietnam, this will encourage popular forces elsewhere in the world. We have, for example, imposed a military dictatorship on Brazil. What happens when the peasantry of the Northeast, for example, should revolt? Well, this, is, this, I think, is the thinking of American strategy and not, not uh, a case of investment. The investments in, in, in Vietnam are not very important. Uh, the, the, the gentleman is asking me a question about if I know something about Iran. He's obviously an, 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 an Iranian, and he has my sympathy. Uh, and I'm sorry I can't give him the microphone, but we're supporting the Shah. We helped to we helped to crush Mossadegh. It was a real nationalist, under cover of an anti-communist cry, and we're pursuing pretty much the same policies in Iran as elsewhere in the world. Uh, the the uh, question is uh, about the speculation that we bombed North Vietnam in order to goad China into uh, coming into the war so we could smash China's nuclear installations. Uh, there is a great deal of talk in military circles, I'm sorry to say, in Washington about smashing China. And uh, it's very terrible and very criminal and very foolish and very mad, in my opinion. We can't smash China. We can't smash that big a part of the human race. And uh, if we wipe out her nuclear installations by pinpoint bombing, uh, she'll rebuild them in 10 or 15 years, or five years, or 10 years. This is the tick of the clock in the life of a great people like China. We have to come to terms with China. But I don't think the bombing of North Vietnam is due to that. I think the bombing of North Vietnam was a, a, re a response of exasperation and frustration. And since we couldn't defeat the uh, guerrillas uh, uh, on their own terrain, uh, we wanted to use this tremendous weapon of ours, our Air Force and our bombing, uh, to flex our muscles and to uh, change the war from a war we couldn't win uh, to a war we could win. Stein? Uh, the, the gentleman says that Professor Scalapino made a very sophisticated and intelligent uh, exposition of of the bombings of North Vietnam and claimed that we were doing it in order to uh, split Hanoi from China and the Soviet Union from China. Is that right? Uh, I think this is much too sophisticated. Uh, I, look, no people yet have surrendered under bombardment. What kind of nonsense is it to think that the North Vietnamese are any different? Nobody surrendered. The, the Spanish didn't surrender. The, the British didn't surrender. The Germans didn't surrender. The Russians didn't surrender. Nobody has, has surrendered under bombardment. This is a delusion of the Air Force. And, and we look. There are very real differences between Hanoi and Peking and Moscow. A shrewd and subtle diplomacy could play upon them to get a viable settlement. But the kind of crude uh, diplomacy that we are using it just defeats itself. None of these three can sell out the other or the Viet Cong. There are differences there. And the differences are deepened. But that doesn't mean we're going to win them over to our side. We talk about, a lot of our people say, well, if, if we get out of Vietnam, that'll prove the Chinese are right and the Russians are wrong. It'll prove that you resist the United States, it's a paper tiger. Why talk about peaceful coexistence? Well, I, I don't know about the argument. Uh, 
What we did in the Dominican Republic has been a bigger help to China than any victory in Vietnam. What we did in the Dominican Republic was to tell the youth and the poor people of Latin America that democratic promises couldn't be trusted, that the Alliance for Progress was a lie, that Johnson was stripping away the benevolent parts of it that Kennedy had imposed, and there was no hope in working with us. That's a very terrible message, a very terrible signal. We can, the, the bombing can increase competition between Moscow and, and uh, Peking. We're not going to, we have to find our way to peace with China. There has to be peaceful coexistence. Sure, the Chinese are difficult, but why shouldn't they be difficult? We've outlawed them, we've embargoed them, we've tried to strangle them. Now look, the Chinese have tremendous assets. Look around you, look around the world at some of the revolutions in, in some places I won't mention. Uh, because I don't want to reflect on anybody. The Chinese, first of all, have got the asset of a tremendously industrious people. Do you know what that means? Have you ever seen a, a, a revolution in a backward country? You can have all the damn rhetoric you want. If people are not used to working hard, you can holler socialism all you want to. It doesn't do much good. But in China, you have a tradition and a habit and a conditioning of industry. And secondly, you have a deep and old civilization and the, the, the task of transplanting to the problems of modern science, the analytical habits of mind, the respect for learning that, that were applied to Confucian classics is very easy. Overnight, those same intellectual qualities can be applied and are being applied. And this is why China has developed a bomb so, so uh, quickly. And thirdly, you have the tremendous motivating power of the humiliation of a great people for a hundred years by Western powers. You know, the Jews haven't forgotten Haman, and the Irish haven't forgotten Cromwell. The opium wars are only a hundred years ago, when for the sake of profit we tried to debauch the Chinese people with opium. Put these three, three things together, under a fresh revolutionary regime that has shown its metal. Look at the difference between the way food shortages have been handled in India and how they were handled in China. Open your eyes to the reality. There's a lot of things about that Chinese government I don't like. I don't like Stalinism. I don't like cult of personality. I don't like thought control. I want to see these things change, but they're not going to be changed by war. We have to recognize that China will be the greatest country in the world within a century, no matter what we do. We have to live with them in fraternity and in peace and in understanding and in appreciation. And since we began the cycle of hatred and the feud, we have to be the first ones to extend the hand of friendship. Let them reject that.